executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So welcome, everyone, to our Green Mountain Care Board meeting today. I do have some scheduling announcements. Uh, next, for next week is um, the day before Thanksgiving, and so we do not have a board meeting. I will let you know, however, that we have a board meeting scheduled on Monday, November 19th, starting at 1 p.m. So we do have a board meeting next week, it's just not on Wednesday. And I would encourage uh, folks, if you haven't already, to please sign in. And that is all I have to announce today. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of Wednesday, November 7th. Is there a motion? Seven. It's been moved and seconded to approve the, the minutes of Wednesday, November 7th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. At this point, we'll ask uh, Mike and uh, Michelle to come forward. <laughs> regarding key responsibilities for the 2019 Vermont Medicare ACO initiative and the 2019 ACO budget regulation. I will say that on the former slide, Kelly Thoreau is listed, but she was not able to uh, attend today. So our agenda is as follows. We have four key sections that we will be reviewing with you today. We will be starting with two proposals for the 2019 Vermont Medicare ACO initiative which is our custom Medicare Next Generation Agreement that CMMI has been working on in conjunction with the Green Mountain Care Board. There are two potential votes for consideration. Mike will then provide an update on the ACO budget review and Medicare benchmark timelines. Third, Sarah Lindberg will come up and Mike will review key areas of the Vermont All-Pair ACO model agreement, including scale, alignment, and the Medicare benchmark. And then finally, we will begin discussing the ACO investments and preliminary recommendations. And Mike will provide a preliminary discussion on one pair's operational budget. Now I will turn it over to Michelle and Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. So as Melissa noted, the first um, item on the agenda is the 2019 Vermont Medicare ACO, ACO initiative and an update on the quality framework. Section 6B of the All Care Model ACO Agreement provides the foundation for this framework that we'll be discussing today, namely the section that holds it there for you. Um, as Melissa mentioned, Vermont and the ACO have the opportunity to design a unique Medicare Next Generation program, which will take effect in 2019. As you'll recall, in July, Pat and I presented a consensus measure set that had been vetted by CMMI, One Care, and the Healthcare Advocate. The set includes 13 measures, which you approved on July 11th. As a reminder, they're there. <laughs> the goal here is to show alignment across the pair of programs and with the measures embedded in the all pair model agreement. I'll again note here that tax measures differ by pair, and the ones selected for this particular Medicare arrangement are notably the Medicare ACM tax. So. In terms of next steps, uh, over the past couple of months, the board staff, HCA, and One Care have been working to finalize a proposal to be considered for the 2019 Vermont Medicare ACO initiative. There are two key points to consider throughout this process. First, which of the selected measures will impact payment from Medicare to the ACO? And then, how will the ACO's performance on those measures impact the amount of the payment received? So again, or fund agreement language. It's important to note here that the proposed framework is very closely aligned with the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation Program through DIVA in terms of withhold percentages, scoring performance, and distribution of those funds based on scoring. 
We'll review some progress to date on the framework. Again, we worked in concert with the HCA and one care throughout this process and are thankful for their continued efforts. CMMI has reviewed and verbally approved the proposal that we're about to share with you. And the next step would be to, um, we are seeking the board's review and approval of the proposal as well. The framework itself is built off of four key elements. The first, withhold percentages for the value-based <coughs> spend. The second, identification of payment measures. Third, scoring performance on payment measures. And fourth, distribution of those value-based incentive funds based on quality of performance. And Pat is going to review each of these with you in detail. Thank you, Michelle. For the record, my name is Pat Jones. I'm staff with the Green Mountain Bay Airport. Um, as Michelle mentioned, there are really four key elements to this framework linking payment to quality. And we wanted to provide a little more detail on each of those elements. So the first um, is the establishment of a value-based incentive fund with withhold percentages. And the Medicare proposal that, um, that we're presenting to you that CMS has reviewed is very aligned with the Medicaid and commercial programs in terms of how the value-based incentive fund is set up and how it's used. So um, it's supported by a withhold um, at percentages that are outlined in the table below. And that withhold comes from the all-inclusive population-based payments that Medicare will be providing to the ACO. So in calendar year 2019, which corresponds with performance year two, the withhold percentage that's proposed is 0.5% of that all-inclusive population-based payment. In, 20, um, in uh, 2020, the percentage would go up to 1%. And then in the out years, we've left that open um, and determined it would be best to see how the program is going and then establish those withhold percentages closer to the actual time of them taking effect. The, the general approach of a value-based incentive fund is that the funds are distributed from that fund based on the quality scores of the ACO. And any um, unearned funds, if they are not distributed in this um, program, would be required to be reinvested in quality improvement activities to address gaps in care and improve performance on certain measures. The second uh, key element is really the identification of which measures will um, serve as payment measures in the model. And this is a slightly more detailed um, listing of the measures from uh, what Michelle just showed you. The top set of measures in this table are what we would call process or clinical measures, and there are 12 of those. And then at the um, bottom of the table are the patient experience measures. While it's one survey and we tend to think of it as one measure, there are actually eight sub-measures or composites. And we are outlining which of these measures impact payment. So in performance uh, years two and three, so that's 2019 and 2020, of those 12 clinical and process measures, eight of them would be linked to payment. That means that how the ACO performs on those measures would impact what percentage of that value-based incentive fund could that be distributed to the provider network of the ACO. The four measures that are not um, suggested for payment in the, the early years are measures that are new in terms of their applicability to Medicare. Um, these are measures that are not um, traditionally in Medicare-related measure sets, but they're very important measures related to mental health and substance abuse treatment. So the idea is to um, have them serve as reporting measures in uh, 2019 and 2020, and then in 21 and 22, move those into the payment route. 
So by the end of, of 2022, all of those process and clinical measures would be linked to payment. In terms of the patient experience measures, again, there are eight um, uh, composites there, and the proposal for 2019 and 20 is for six of those eight to be uh, linked to payment or for them to continue to be payment uh, measures throughout the life of the agreement. And two of the measures would be slated to be reporting measures in performance years two and three. Um, one is the health status and functional status composite that's uh, um, recommended for reporting throughout the term of the agreement. The stewardship of patient resources is a reporting measure in performance years two and three. Um, and we felt that we would want to revisit that in advance of 2021 to see if that should remain reporting or move to a performance measure. So the upshot is that um, in 2019 and 2020, there was a total of 14 um, payment measures. That's about 70% of the, of the total set of measures. And then uh, in the out years, over nine, at least 90% of the measures would, would contribute to payment decisions. The next, um, the next area is uh, scoring and how performance is scored on those quality measures. And the way it would work is that each of those payment measures would be scored individually and they would each carry equal weight in terms of the overall ACO quality score. Again, reporting measures, while they'll be reported, would not be scored. Lung care's performance would then be compared to the national Medicare results, um, the percentile benchmarks when those are available. And the ACO can earn up to two points per measure. The total possible number of points is the number of payment measures times that maximum of two points. So as you can see in the table below, there are 14 measures. So for performance years two and three, 2019 and 2020, um, there's a total maximum point value of 28 points. In performance years four and five, as we add in some of those mental health and substance abuse measures and potentially another patient experience measure, that total would go up to either 36 or 38 total points. Beginning in the third performance year, so 2020, under this Medicare proposal, one care would be able to earn points for improvement over the prior year's performance. But in no circumstance could they exceed the maximum uh, total possible points. So the combination of quality points compared to the Medicare benchmark and improvement points cannot exceed 28 points in performance years two and three, and either the 36 or 38 and four and five. This just shows a little more detail on how um, performance is scored. So the left-hand column is the you know, percentile ranking. So this, will, this would be where the ACO's performance on a particular measure falls uh, in terms of their percentile ranking compared to the Medicare benchmarks. And you can see that um, obviously the highest number of points for 90th percentile and above, that's where they would get the maximum of two points. And I just want to point out that um, in uh, quality improvement circles, 90th percentile is considered to be pretty much the highest achievable benchmark. So they would get the maximum number of points there, and then um, with declining point values as their percentile ranking um, goes down. And you can see that in uh, performance years four and five, the, the point values get more stringent as uh, the performance moves down the percentile ranking. 
And then the next uh, element is how are those funds that are in the value-based incentive fund uh, distributed <coughs> depending on how the ACO performs on all of its quality measures in aggregate. And you probably noticed in the, uh, in the proposal, the memo that you received describing this proposal, that there are some excruciatingly detailed tables um, at the end of the memo. And this is just an excerpt um, from one of those tables. And it um, speaks to uh, performance year to uh, 2019. There, the the value-based incentive fund withhold, you may recall, is 0.5%. And this excerpt from the table just shows how the funds would be distributed between uh, distribution to network providers and funds for reinvestment in quality improvement initiatives. So you can see that if the ACO gets 14 out of the 28 total points, that um, about half of the payment would be distributed to network providers and about half would then be available for reinvestment in QI initiatives. And this uh, very much mirrors what's in the Medicaid um, contract, the Vermont Medicaid Next Gen program. And I just want to note that in terms of those quality improvement initiatives, the, the expectation and what's outlined in the memo is that one care would report to the Green Mountain Care Board annually, probably through the ACO budget review process on the amount of dollars that are being used for quality improvement initiatives, what the initiatives are that would be supported by those dollars, and the progress that the ACO would expect to be attained as a result of those um, investments in quality improvement initiatives. So that's, um, that's the end of my, I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle in a moment, but I, I did want to just make a couple of key points. One is that um, there really is um, strong alignment in this proposal with what is currently in the Vermont Medicaid Next Gen agreement and also in the commercial agreements, and that is a, a goal of the all-payer models to have a, alignment across payers. I want to especially thank um, Julia Shaw from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, and Sarah Barry from Lung Care Vermont for their work. We had a series of meetings to develop this consensus proposal. I want to thank Michelle for her leadership in, in that effort. And I want to um, emphasize again that CMS has indicated approval for this proposal. Obviously, this speaks to the agreement between Lawn Care and CMS. So I'll turn it back over to Michelle for some closing thoughts on this topic. So Pat did a really great job of wrapping up. I'll talk a little bit about future work and then swap to the decision point. Um, so future work, as Pat sort of noted in her discussion, will include facilitation of discussions, again, between uh, CMMI, OneCare, and the HCA. Um, as you saw, some of those um, both withholds and measures are to be determined in some out years. So we'll have a subsequent proposal uh, to submit to the board and to CMMI, establishing those performance year four and five percentages um, for the value based incentive fund and establishing the distribution of those funds based on the quality score. Um, so, with that detail, you know, we're seeking the board's approval on those four key elements that Pat went through in detail. So, again, the withhold percentage for the value based incentive fund, the identification of those payment measures from the approved quality measure set the scoring of the ACO performance on those measures, and finally, the distribution of those funds based on the quality of score achieved. Should have Questions on this, this topic now or the potential vote is what we were thinking. Okay. 
So questions from the board? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, um, can you put the timing of things? So, you know, if the withhold percentage is 0.5, and then when do we actually get the quality, when the quality results come in to be able to then marry up how much went, you know, to each bucket, that example you gave of the 14. The summer following the end of the performance year, so late summer, early fall. Um, so that's why we were thinking perhaps the ACO budget process would be a good place to review that since we're here in front of you now. We'd be able to talk about the prior calendar year at this time. Um, <clears throat> just uh, to get some scale here to turn these percentages into, into dollars. Uh, so for um, performance here in uh, 2019, what, do you have an estimate of what one half of one percent equals um, in, the, in that fund? Um, we reserve the right to check on this, but we believe <laughs> it's about um, three million. It's, it's not an insignificant amount of dollars. So we'll, we'll actually uh, follow up on that. Okay. I, I asked a question just to get a sense of, as it trickles through this uh, uh, um, matrix of, of scoring, you know, how, how small an increment does, uh, does this get reduced to? So um, that's kind of the, the core of the question. Other questions or comments from the board? Not a whole crowd to the uh, public for any uh, questions or comments. Yes. So uh, I want to uh, echo some of the good feelings. I, uh, I think um, if Julia were here, she, uh, she, uh, we appreciate the, uh, the collaborative effort and uh, uh, we did join uh, with the board and one care in the proposal in front of you. Um, but I, I also do have to say out loud that uh, we will continue, as, you know, as time goes forward, to call for uh, and advocate for uh, more stringent uh, uh, measures, more stringent ways of uh, counting um, whether quality measures have been met and the distribution of money. Do you have a specific example of what that might be? Um, I think so. Again, we're supporting. The proposal in front of you, but uh, as time goes forward, I think the concept of giving uh, quality payments for measures uh, that uh, one care is less than 50% of the national average uh, is something uh, that didn't make sense to us, or, some, uh, or maybe I should say we will advocate for uh, moving to a higher level of quality of, of comparison to the rest of the country. So that raises a question for me. Um, once these are approved, how often can they be changed? Well, I guess technically, um, I'm, I'm assuming that Medicare will continue to do um, an annual type of agreement with the ACO. So I guess in the most technical sense, um, you could, um, you know, see some changes annually. As Michelle and I both mentioned, there's a couple of areas where, for some of the reasons that Mike just indicated, we, you know, we wanted to hold off. Like, for example, how much of a withhold should there be? We didn't have consensus on that and felt it was important enough to hold off on making that decision. We were comfortable <coughs> nailing down 2019 and 2020, but we would love to come back together for 21 and 22. And that's an example where um, things could change. You know, the, obviously if the science changes around a particular measure, we would want to look at that. In, in general, the idea of um, trying to keep measures constant so that the provider network has some focus and knows um, what to work on, and we can really engage in some of that overtime improvement is valuable. But if a measure is considered to be no longer a good measure or valid measure, that would be something we would want to revisit as well, I should think. 
But um, you know, this again would go into the agreement between Lung Care and CMS, and as far as I know, those are still annual um, agreements. So it's your vision that we only be approving it for the 2019. Our vision is that you'd be approving um, it as proposed, and so there are some decisions that are um, across all four years. For example, a lot of most of the measures are proposed to be payment measures across all four years, um, and some of the um, decisions are two-year decisions, like on the percentage of withhold. We would expect to come back to you on those areas where we did not make a recommendation, but for the ones that we did, we would not anticipate revisiting them unless there was a compelling reason to do so. Other questions or comments from the public? Seeing no other discussion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Designate someone 
outside their organization to serve for them. Uh, it is language is currently in the agreement. Um, it is not inconsistent in any way with Rule 5 that governs ACO uh, governing body composition. And so I don't see any problem with accommodating this request. Um, One Care, like I mentioned, also wants to make some changes to the Medicare beneficiary notice and patient fact sheet that they want to propose to CMMI. Um, they wanted to improve the readability of those materials based on input from Medicare beneficiaries. You should have received a copy of the revised materials in your packets. Um, essentially, the new, the new version still covers the same basic topics as the last one. and has the same bas basic format, but is written in a, a simpler manner. Um, CMS would still have to approve these materials, and I believe that they will require some changes be made. For example, um, I think they will require that uh, language be added about uh, the Medicare benefit enhancements that are available through the program. Um, however, since it's a change to what we are sending on to CMMI, I wanted to bring it to you to get your okay before we send it. So in terms of decision points, I guess the question I would put to the board is, may we send uh, one care to revise and then to CMMI with the new governance language for the new beneficiary notice and patient action. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, let's start with questions. So I'm a little bit concerned about opening the uh, door on the designated representatives. Maybe I would feel more comfortable if you could give me some real good examples of a specific situation. A uh, specific situation that's happened that could that you could envision happening. I could envision um, a uh, designated so one care board managers, um, certain provider groups elect representatives and um, if so for example designated agencies um, if they wanted to, to designate someone who wasn't a, a designated agency to serve as their representative on the board of managers that would be what this would be is that helpful so i can see one thing well, you have a designated agency, but you're saying that you can basically designate anybody, and that person wouldn't have the knowledge. Um, that's good. Um, so, for like a, a, an association president of a, of a um, like FQAC association, for example, might be someone that they would want to designate is not. But if they're an employee of that group, aren't they really a participant or preferred provider? None of those terms are defined in the Medicare agreement. Because you have to remember that these terms are defined by Medicare, so uh, the preferred provider has a specific meaning in the agreement. So I think in the, the example Mike was giving, which is um, the, a designated agency that participates in one care may say, hey, I want somebody from my state to sit on the board of managers because they have a statewide perspective. I just have a perspective of my specific area. That actually would provide better representation to FQHCs across the state. You can see why that would work, but by state is not a preferred provider because they're not actually a provider, technically. Other questions? 
And it's my understanding that this is actually aligned with what's actually the, the language in the agreement. So we're trying to align what's in the agreement with. Yeah, the second bullet there is the language that is currently in the Medicare participation agreement. And I was just trying to highlight that this is not new language. It's language that they originally deleted, I think, unintentionally. Um, and want to add back in. And our rule five um, on this specific um, subject allows for um, des designated representatives of providers to serve. Questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I, I, I have a little bit of the same concern that you started out with, uh, Kevin. Um, I, I just, uh, so can, can you explain a little bit of the history as to why this language was added back, what that discussion uh, was about? Um, it was um, adding flexibility. For providers to choose who they want to represent their interests on the board of managers. And I think so, could a, um, a designated representative be a lobbyist? Um, I've, uh, that's a good question. I don't think that's the intent. I think, you know, you could meet in the network um, become, comes after designated representatives. Um, but if, if you're uncomfortable with, with this, I can go back and get clarifications on this this specific issue and test some test some possibilities with with one care. Um, it would seem to be something. Yeah, my my concern is that the language could be great, but it, but sometimes language like that uh, is a kind of a buffer between the, the um, uh, having the better knowledge at the table. Um, and uh, it, it, it could, you know, I, I could see where it, it would, might not be that helpful um, to have uh, people that are kind of uh, paid lobbyists, you know, in a management position um, that's so important to healthcare reform. Um, can I just say, as far as a legal read on this, for one thing, the consistency kind of gives us some credibility and it allows for flexibility, but it doesn't mandate that. Um, this assumes that out of the, um, when read in the full context, this um, is the same type of uh, language and that it allows um, a designee in the network to, um, to, be, to participate. So, um, you know, we can look at it again, but as far as like a legal read of this, I don't think it's the um, creative horribles that this they could just designate somebody Nowhere, but um, what would the threshold be for designation, Judy? What would the threshold be? Yep. Well, um, you have the ability to designate a hearing officer for hearings, and I guess it would be assumed that you wouldn't just pick Pam Davis or someone out of the audience and do that. Hearing <laughs> officer. Um, so again, I think it would have to be reviewed in okay, context. I, I and if you want the concern. board. If you want the board, uh, if you want the staff to um, look at this more in context, but I, I, I do think that um, it's, it's good to be cautious, but I, I do think that um, some of this language has been vetted and was consistent, and it's not that it's getting added, it's, it's getting um, put back in as, as far as um, that goes. So I, I, I understand the concerns, but I think that um, the looking to the worst possible extent probably isn't needed, and we can look at this in context of the agreement, but um, my understanding is as it reads and as it was omitted and as it's consistent with other language, um, that it's a, a relatively harmless um, and consistent with the agreement um, replacement of the language. Do you have other comments or questions from the board? No, we'll open it up to the public for comments or questions. Yes. To clarify, is this just on the governance or are we talking about the new patient fact sheet and the other materials too? So I believe we're talking just about governance right now. Okay. Your question is only on governance. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank 
So uh, we'll be back. We'll be back before a bunch of times. If you're not ready to vote, then that's fine. I can I can follow up with all your concerns about about the language. Actually, Yes, Susan. Um, Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. There's some language on the fact sheet. I mean, there's nothing on the fact sheet that would tell a person who's been attributed to an ACO what that means to them. There's some language on the fact sheet that says, how might one care benefit me? And there's some language there about how one care might benefit someone. But I think the corollary is equally true. It needs to be explored. How might I benefit one care? One care is going to receive a monthly payment on my behalf, no matter what services I use or don't use. One care might receive a quality payment on my behalf if I lose weight or quit smoking or do something else. One care might benefit from me being attributed. And I really do believe that people have a right to know that, to know that they're I really need a better term for this. If anyone has a suggestion, please email me. Attributed lives are essentially cash cows. They earn money for one care. One care gets paid not just for Medicare, uh, for their medical care, but for the Medicaid ACO, they also get a $6 per member per month payment. So they, people are generating funds for one care, but nothing in the notice tells anyone that. They have no way of knowing, nor do they know that they are entitled to other benefits, the enhanced benefits that one care has been applying for permission to, to run and running and, or piloting or not running, but no one knows that they don't have to stay in a hospital for three days if they're in a treated life, and one care never has done anything to tell them. So really, I don't think the fact sheet goes far enough as far as informing a person, just an individual Vermonter, what it means to be in a treated life. It doesn't tell him anything. It's kind of a fine line that you have to cover because if you make it into a book, they won't read it. At least I wouldn't. Um, but does the healthcare's healthcare advocates office want to weigh in on faction? Uh, no, we we don't have comment. Does anyone else have a comment? Question? Seeing none. Would you want an individual motion on this or would you prefer to hold on this one until we're ready on the avatar? Just, just hold. Just hold. Okay.
December 12th. Uh, we have scheduled um, in case 1128 doesn't work, and um, if it does, then to follow up uh, to the extent necessary and have potential votes on both the Medicare benchmark and the ACO budget. And then um, kind of the last yearly date we, we can go uh, with this is 12-17 on Monday to finish this up. Um, and once we do finish it up, uh, we need to submit the Medicare benchmark to CMMI for approval ASAP. Any questions on, on that? And a recollection somehow that there was a meeting on the last one. Has that been uh, reviewed? <coughs> I'm sorry. Was that? Uh, it was, yeah, we did have an key on there. One Care's Board of Managers is um, meeting on the 18th. Um, and so we rescheduled for the 17th. Monday versus a Wednesday, so so we if we approve the Medicare benchmark, they can have something to review. Sign that sounds reasonable. Okay, great. Um, maybe just show some charts. Uh, remind us about high level requirements for the model. <laughs> Um, gosh, these colors got a little blood out. I'm sorry about that. But uh, so the first thing I wanted to kind of orient everyone to is uh, the different populations in play when we talk about the all-payer model. So the faint line at the very top um, is the Vermont population. So uh, anything that is dashed would represent an estimate or projection. Anything solid is what's in the book so far. So for instance, uh, we won't get the population estimates for Vermont for 18 until the spring. Um, they tend to shave a little bit off these days, so that line might go down a smidge after those come out. Um, and then the darker purple line below that is the denominator we're using when we talk about scale. So what we um, are targeting for getting people in the model is not the same uh, number as we count for the total cost of care. And that is the um, fainter line below it. Woo. And that is uh, the population that we're using when we calculate the total cost of care. So they used to be pretty well aligned, but then this guy called Algo Bay went to court <laughs> and lost. <laughs> so self-funded employers uh, who uh, aren't a governmental plan and get an exemption no longer have to submit their claims to VCARES. So um, that is what that big uh, decline between 16 and 17 is. So as a result, this is the number that is working in terms of getting people in the model, but this is the people for whom we have claims and VCARES and are eligible for calculating these um, performance measures. Um, the scale target for 2019 is 50%, so about halfway from there to there, um, is the, where we're trying to be for 2019. As you can see, uh, the attribution for the ACO is growing quickly. Um, you know, we are climbing at a fast rate, which is what you want to see. Um, so this again is just people um, prospectively aligned to one care, and then the smallest pop, uh, line down here is those who are um, ACO attributed Medicare beneficiaries. So for the first few uh, years of the agreement. Any Medicare performance metrics are just tied to this population, and eventually it um, extends to the Medicare population at large. All right, so uh, these are more estimates. So uh, on the left-hand column are come from the numbers we submitted to the legislature about how we thought we were doing on, on scale. Uh, these numbers will be revised as newer data come in, but at that time, we were estimating about a 36% performance uh, on the all payer or on the Medicare target, and we should have been at 60%. And the all payer we estimated about 20% aligned to the ACO when the target was 35. So again, a lot of till days, meaning a lot of uncertainty for 2019 hasn't happened yet. 
Uh, but we're thinking we're probably going to come in around 50% for Medicare, um, where the target is 75% for the Medicare scale target, and about 35% for the all-payer, where the target is 50%. So basically, we're about a year behind um, when it comes to performance on the scale initiatives. Um, a couple of populations to keep your eye on. Uh, this self-funded number is in a lot of ways the fuzziest, and that goes back to that GoBay decision. Uh, we have to do a lot of estimating to figure out who's not there. It's definitely a known unknown, uh, so it's one of the least uh, certain estimates we have. Uh, and the other thing, this guy is really creeping up in recent years. That would be the Medicare Advantage business. Uh, we're observing a pretty steady state increase, uh, you know, north of 10% of the Medicare population at this point. Um, why that's notable is it tends to be a healthier population, and for the all-payer model purposes, they're going to count as commercial. So that's good risk kind of going to our commercial market, um, which will wash out in terms of the all-payer uh, performance, but might make it a little um, tougher on the Medicare side of things for performance measures. So at the end of the day, what we're on the hook for, for the uh, agreement for financial performance, is whatever the all-payer total cost of care is in 2022 compared to what it was in 2017, and then we compound that by taking it to the fifth power and take away one. Um, so basically, uh, we can see if we're on track or not to get there, um, but we're, it's a very long-term goal. It's over the full course of the agreement. Um, also, bear in mind that when we talk about the total cost of care, which I always joke should be the sum of some care, um, we're not thinking about things like dental, uh, pure dental coverage, uh, retail pharmacy, so express, express script, stuff like that. And then there's many services provided through Medicaid, um, such as home and community-based services, which are not included. So what, um, at the end of the day, only about half of the Medicaid spending is actually included in the total cost of care. Uh, so when you see APM total cost of care metrics, they might not match other performance uh, measures of cost, and there's usually a good reason, so ask me. Um, okay, and then we can talk about the target. So again, we're on the hook for this compounding target to date, and the, the agreement states that you know the target is 3.5% or less over the course of the agreement, However, um, a corrective action is not triggered unless we exceed 4.3%. And again, that's the compounding growth rate. So we're talking about starting performance year two. So we'll take the growth rate in 19, compare it to 17, take the square root. We're going to see where we're at. Um, and then in terms of how it's calculated, the data are messy. But what we try to do for the clean side of things is we look at the data we have available in VCures. We try and figure out what the primary payer is for the month, or I should say primary payer type. So if someone has coverage from Medicare and Medicaid, we're going to count them as Medicare. And then we'll take all the primary allowed amounts from that primary payer paid in that month. Why that's important is that it's going to include both what the insurer paid and the member's responsibility. So if any subsequent coverage helps cover the member's share, it's still in there. It just didn't actually get paid by Medicare or the member. So we still have the full cost. It's allocated based on the primary coverage for the month. Um, and you know, I think that's about the best we can do given the data sources available to us. Uh, then on top of that, we include a non-claims component in the total cost of care. So that includes things like the population-based payments given by Medicaid, um, savings or losses achieved by the ACO, um, as well as blueprint and community health team payments. So it's pretty explicit in the agreement, any savings or losses by the ACO are added to the total cost of care or deducted from the total cost of care. So that is in incorporated into the total cost of care when we're calculating it. All right, Medicare. So again, for the first few years of the agreement, um, when we talk about the Medicare total cost of care, we're really talking about the subset of beneficiaries who are attributed to the ACO. Um, and again, this really is a compounding target, and we can only uh, look at how we're doing to date. But the agreement says that our target is 0.2 percentage points 
less than the national projections for that same compounding time period. Um, and in here, the corrective action would not be triggered unless that uh, calculation were to exceed 0.1 of what the national projections were. So it's a little bit funny. We get our target well in advance. The call letter comes out each April. We know where we need to hit. But then we don't get to actually assess our performance until well after the year is over. So for instance, for the current performance year, 2018, we need to get 18 in the books, let the claims settle out, figure out the savings before we know what the total cost of care in 18 was for the ACO beneficiaries. Then we get to compare that to what a theoretical year would have looked like for the same provider list in 2017. And that's the ratio we're gonna use for the 17 to 18 growth rate We'll have to do a similar calculation of 18 over 19, take those, the product of those, and we'll square root, and then we'll get the um, compounding target today. And that's what we need to see is 0.2 less than those national projections. So essentially for 19, we probably won't know where we stand until the middle third quarter of 2020. Data's fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, what those growth targets look like? So again, this comes from what they call the call letter. Um, it is what Medicare uses to try and get um, commercial insurers to participate in Medicare Advantage. So as part of that letter each year, they try and project what spending looks like. And they divide it out into what they call traditional fee for service and the Medicare Advantage population. Um, and so they further break those estimates down into two big populations. There's um, almost, you know, 99 percent plus are aged and disabled in Vermont, so that's kind of your, you know, business as usual kind of Medicare. And then there's the end stage renal disease, and while they're a fraction of a percent of the population here in Vermont, they're um, quite a bit more expensive as a population, as you can see. Um, so they do separate projections for those two beneficiary groups. Then they blend those two together in order to get a blended growth rate, and the only time that really comes into place is when we talk about trending um, savings or losses forward in the benchmark calculation. So just based on the call letter, um, the annual growth rate um, from 18 to 19 in the 19 call letter was 4% for the Asian disabled, 3.3 for the end stage renal disease, and that um, blends to the four, usually it's pretty close because it's so much more of the population. <coughs> so then we take that, and then each of these we multiply by 3.7% because of the floor, we use 3.7. We know that's the first term in the equation, which compounds to the 3.9, 3.5, and 3.9. So again, in the, at the end of 2020, we'll have to take a look at everything that's happened to date and see how we do compared to the targets. Um, great, Medicare benchmark. So again, the benchmark is really a financial target um, that's set for the ACO. And uh, it's basically a combination of some sort of estimate of um, spending in 2018 based on the provider list coming up in 2019. Uh, we multiply that by the anticipated number of beneficiaries in the upcoming performance year. And then this is the trend factor that is decided on by, by the GNCB. And that's what comes up to the Medicare benchmark. Um, and then again, once we have those set for the ESRD and the aged and disabled populations, then we have to then add on any savings realized by the ACO or deduct any losses by the ACO. Um, and similarly, again, on the all payer side, we're doing similar stuff, we're adding blueprint payments and that in their life for um, commercial payers. So it's trying to get the full kind of picture of spending, if that makes sense. That was like that. Oh, one more, okay. Oh, I just said this though. <laughs> so, oh, another thing. So 19, uh, due to the risk arrangements elected by the ACO in 18, um, anything that happens plus or minus, they are expecting savings. They only get to, um, they're only eligible to keep up to 80% of the savings. Um, the rest goes back to Medicare. And that was due to some risk protection that they elected. Um, and yeah, just that, you know, the savings counts as spending for the total cost of care calculations. Just, want to make sure that's on our minds. <laughs> All right, thank you. <coughs> so Sarah talked about <coughs> scale, um, and I wanted to go over with you the scale target ACO initiative requirements. So in order for someone to count, um, someone who's attributed to an ACO to count towards those scale targets, they have to be attributed under what's called a 
scale target ACO initiative, and there are four requirements set out in the agreement um, uh, for what one of these initiatives is. First, there has to be a possibility of shared savings for achieving goals related to quality care or utilization. Second, the ACO's shared savings must be at least 30%. The program doesn't have to be a two-sided risk model where the ACO is at risk for losses, but if it is, then the ACO's risk for shared losses also has to be at least 30%. Third, the services the ACO is financially responsible for must uh, at least include services comparable to all payer financial target services for Medicaid and commercial insurers that um, uh, and self-funded that, that is uh, acute hospital and patient and outpatient care, post-acute care, professional services, and durable medical equipment. And then finally, the ACO's benchmark shared savings, shared losses, or some combination has to be tied to the quality of care that the ACO delivers, the health of its line beneficiaries or both, which is um, basically the value-based incentive fund proposal that Michelle and Pat discussed with you. So I want to talk about what we can gather from the budget submission in terms of 2019 programs and what they may look like in terms of these requirements. Um, so as, as you know, for 2018, there's a, a Medicare program, Medicaid program, Blue Cross Blue Shield, QHP program, and uh, EV, EVMMC self-funded health plan program. Um, we presented earlier in the year on how these programs, uh, at least we thought, met these four requirements for an ACO scale target initiative. Um, CMS is going to have to concur with, with that assessment. We report to them next year on this. Um, so in terms of 20, 19 changes to these programs. Um, obviously, the, the programs are not finalized, but one pair's budget suggests they may change in the ways that we show here. Um, with the Medicare program, one pair's budget uh, is built on moving from an 80% gain loss share to a 100% share. Um, and then, as Pat and Michelle talked about, uh, the Medicare program will likely include a quality withhold as the mechanism for tying financial performance to quality performance. With the Medicaid program, uh, one here is budgeting a 4% risk corridor, whereas the corridor this year was 3%. Um, one here is also budgeting an increase to the percentage of the benchmark withheld for the value-based incentive fund. With the Blue Cross program, um, there's a possibility um, that one care would not be responsible for non-specialty pharmacy in 2019, which is not an all-payer financial target service. Uh, and then with the existing self-funded program, the budget indicates that in addition to expanding, it may move from shared savings to shared risk with a core order of 6% and a risk gain share of 30%. So we need that 30% requirement for a scale target ACO initiative. <clears throat> um, the basic takeaway is that none of these changes we think would seem to disqualify uh, those programs that are existing in 2018 um, from being considered scale target ACO initiatives with these changes. Um, and then uh, One Care's budget describes that they're working on uh, a potential new self-funded program, which they're still very early in the negotiations, and it's really not described in enough detail to say whether it might qualify as a, a scale target ACO initiative, although One Care is pretty clear that it intends to develop the program as such. Um, if you'll recall, last year we were in kind of a similar situation where we the Blue Cross Blue Shield program and the UVMC program were not finalized around this time, and um, the way you guys dealt with it in the budget order was um, putting a condition in there that um, one care had to come back, submit a written report demonstrating to your satisfaction that those programs did qualify as 
um, scale target ACO initiatives. So I just wanted to um, remind you of that and give you this uh, summary with, you know, in the context of the all payer model of the requirements. Uh, the all payer model agreement also requires that scale target ACO initiatives are reasonably aligned with the Medicare ACO program on things like beneficiary alignment methodologies, ACO quality measures, payment mechanisms, and risk arrangements. Uh, there doesn't have to be complete alignment, but we will need to justify any material differences or present CMS with a plan to have to bridge those differences if we can't justify them and they shouldn't exist. Um, we asked one carrier in their budget about how their 2019 programs align, and realizing that these programs are still being negotiated, we tried to put the major takeaways here. Um, so one carrier is contemplating changes to the alignment for attribution methodology used in the Medicaid program. Uh, potential changes include expanding the definition of primary care providers, including additional codes to the list of qualifying evaluation and management uh, codes that are used to attribute people, extending the claims look back period from two to three years, uh, and then there are no changes uh, to attribution methodology anticipated for the other payers. With quality measures, um, Pat and Michelle will talk to you a couple times about um, the Medicare measures and all the work that's been done to get reasonable alignment of quality measures across payers. In terms of payment mechanisms, um, 2019 looks like it will be a continuation of 2018, where the public payers will be utilizing the all-inclusive population-based payment mechanism, and other payers uh, continuing to pay a fee-for-service and pay one care a, a PNPM amount to support its population health management. Um, one care explained that Blue Cross has been un unable to implement the AIPDP uh, with their claims processing system. Um, as you know, the, the AIPDP basically allows one care to make fixed payments to the hospitals, and it's um, a significant risk management tool for them. So this is a potential alignment issue that we may have to address to CMS uh, in our report, and we may need one care's help in doing that. And then in terms of risk arrangements, um, all the risk programs that one care described in the, the budget are symmetrical shared risk arrangements where the same Sharing percentages and caps apply to both shared savings and shared losses. Um, the exact percentages differ from payer to payer, um, but those are tightening up this year as the Medicaid risk corridor is expanding from 3 to 4 percent, and the sharing percentage in the Medicare program is budgeted to increase from 80 percent to 100 percent, like it is in Medicaid. <coughs> With respect to the services included in determining shared savings and losses, like I mentioned, there's a potential for non-specialty phar non pharmacy to no longer be in the Blue Cross program, um, which, you know, good thing or bad thing, it, it, it's in none of the other programs, so it uh, will create more alignment. I just have one question about the uh, attribution methodology changes in Medicaid. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, changing the unit codes, expanding the list of qualifying mm -hmm. primary care providers, expanding the look back. I'm trying to get a sense of what is the estimated impact of those methodology changes. And I was looking back on Sarah's table for Medicaid, and I know you have a tilde for uh, the 140,000 there, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, is that accounting for that change in attribution methodology? 
I would think that caseloads are falling, so that that number would have gone down, but then if you're changing attribution to potentially get more Medicaid patients in, that would make it go up. So I'm trying to figure out what the net effect is. Do you have a sense, anybody? I don't have a sense, and I don't know whether those estimates, well, I don't have a sense, but we can check with Eva. I, my sense is that the, the main driver of the increase in Medicaid attribution is the addition of the hospitals. three communities. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, but I was looking at the 136,000 APM population from 18 to 140,000. Yeah. I recognize that the population in the start and then scale target initiatives went way up because of the hospitals, but I was also thinking just the baseline population. Just trying to figure that out. Yeah. The other, but it, 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 I'd be interested in knowing, knowing that too. We could ask Diva if they can tell us what. Fantastic. And they're coming Monday, so maybe I'll we'll, we'll <laughs> ask again on Monday. Um, There's also a lot of disruption that happens around January 1st, so that's part of the trickiness. <laughs> okay, great. I just, and also, I was just wondering how, actually, this is on that same table, Sarah, the um, commercial self funded. Um, I'm just, I, I am trying to figure out how you actually get that estimate given the GoBay decision, given like, how are you figuring out what is the potential population there? I see you have it going down, so I'm also just wondering. Yeah, I think the previous estimate probably was a little uh, hot, uh, so that probably will be adjusted when we reach these numbers. Um, but the other, um, you just want to go forward one more. Yeah, so the other primary source we have for this information is something called um, the Annual Statement Supplemental Report. Um, so that's something that's tied to the uh, annual statements that insurers have to file with uh, DFR every year. So there's people that have to file those statements that don't have to submit their claims to each year's. Okay. Um, we're also trying to get a better sense um, the vendor who collects our claims data. Um, so everyone has to register. It doesn't matter if you have to submit your claims, but as part of that registration pro process, they're asking for the full Vermont Book of Business, mm -hmm. and that'll give us a lot better way to get that estimate. As a follow-up on that, do they, do they even break it down by hospital service areas? They... When they're doing that bottom of the DFR. Oh, gosh, no. 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 Okay. No, and, and honestly, the way, I don't know that that'd be relevant for them. Like, yeah, it, it, it's hard. It would be relevant for them, but it might be helpful to try to figure this out. Yeah, and honestly, I think um, for, so what's important to an insurer is the, the situs of the business, like where is the contract. Um, so residency is kind of not as important in their world. So honestly, I think a lot of those filers just take a percentage of their total book of business to estimate. Like, I don't think it's the, the strongest estimate in the world, but it's the best we have. So I, I wouldn't necessarily put a lot of faith in anything they were, were to break down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No nope, that was it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Other questions? Maureen? Uh, yeah, just two questions. Um, First, have we aligned on what the starting point is for the Vermont, um, all the, t the total cost of care in 2017? We're still uh, completing the validation, so we should have that. Um, very sure, I was hoping to have it for today, and including a historical look, so you can see what it's been looking like by payer type over time. Okay. Um, and then when you talk about the corrective action for Medicare, which is not to exceed 0.1% of the national projections, mm -hmm. How does it factor in that we started off at a higher point the first year? Yep, so uh, as far as accountability goes, that 3.7 is set in the equation. So that is the accountability term. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay. And now we're going to move on to um, talk about <coughs> Cares and investments. Well, hold on, wait. I wasn't going to turn it over to. Oh, sorry. I'll we'll look at it first because I didn't think there was any decision point here for the time being. But apparently, uh, Susan does have a question, so let's stay on topic and go to it. I just have a question going back to that chart you guys were just discussing on page 26, the model of the <laughs> scale estimates. When you discuss the commercial Medicare Advantage and the increase there, I, this is really just a clarification. My understanding is that uh, Medicare beneficiaries who sign up for Medicare Advantage plans are not eligible for attribution. Is that? 
Uh, so they, today, since there's no Medicare Advantage plans participating, that, that's why. Uh, if, if for some reason they, they contract with ACO, they would be. But yeah, it's just a lack of participation. Not, that's the only thing that, it's not that they're ineligible, and that's why they count for scale. Do you have any trend data showing? I was really surprised at those numbers, because my understanding was that not too many people in Vermont used Medicare Advantage plans. So do you have any numbers, or could you direct me where I might be able to find like how much Medicare Advantage use has been increasing over time in Vermont year to year? Check out the Medicare enrollment dashboard. Uh, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's really creepy. And, it, and you know, we're, we've been quite an anomaly to date uh, in terms of our penetration rate. We've been under 10% for a long, long time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, pardon. Excuse me. Uh, but yeah, as of late, and I think there's been some concerted uh, targeting of Vermont. Uh, it, it, when I listen to the radio anyway, I hear quite a few um, advertisements for it. This chart, um, as Mike mentioned, the legislature provided statutory requirements for the board to consider when reviewing the ACO's budget. And 
wonders investments are seen in program development and financial investments to address their population health outcomes. OneCare develops their investment priorities through their finance and population health strategy committee, and then they're approved by their board of managers. So we, sh we are showing what we approved last year in the 2018 budget cycle and what they submitted in the 2019 budget cycle. Last year, they focused their PMPM payments to primary care and the blueprint and the continuum of care to provide additional support for providers. This year, they have several new programs, which I'll talk about in a moment. And of note, most, most line items are increasing from year over year, and that is mostly due to attribution because it's tied to the PMPM for that attributed life. Um, I will note that the primary prevention line halfway down was at 1.5 million, and this year it's slightly lower, and that is due to one care adopting the Rise Vermont program as their own and incorporating those staffing into their operational budget. As well, they had the regional clinical collaborative uh, representatives in that line item, and now it's broken up this year as well to make it easier for all to read. So I wanted to highlight what some of their 2019 new initiatives are, or expanded initiatives. They have um, their comprehensive payment reform program that they um, offered to three independent practices this year, testing it out with them, and they provided a preliminary report to the board in June, which was showing that it was going to be um, a successful pilot, and they offered it to other, other entities uh, this coming year that Michelle will speak about in a minute. Um, they're also piloting an initiative for independent specialists to test one or more pilot programs in this coming year. They uh, have several new adverse childhood event pilots that we'll discuss later in the presentation. They also have a community-based innovation fund initiative where uh, communities will be able to apply to them to test out evidence-based programs that could be spreadable to other communities. And. Um, they're contracting, or through Medicaid, they're developing an accountable community for health pilot where more providers in the community would be accountable as well as the geographic uh, attribution may be applied, methodology may be applied. Um, we're actually interested in having uh, Medicaid speak to that at some point, either on Monday or when the project has been developed in the future. And then finally, as you heard earlier this summer, uh, from RISE Vermont and OneCare that they are expanding to a statewide collaboration, which I will speak to uh, a bit later in the presentation. Okay. <coughs> As Mike mentioned, there's statutory criteria outlining uh, the Blueprint for Health sort of payment. So OneCare built their model upon the existing Blueprint for Health, CHT, and community collaboratives through its contract with Medicare. OneCare is continuing those PCMH payments uh, for Medicare Lives and the CHD and SASH payments as well. I'll note here the complex care coordination program was designed to enable providers across the healthcare continuum to better manage the care of the highest risk payments. This is also done through a PMCM <coughs> model. There's regional clinical representatives, and they're identified and contracted with OneCare Vermont for about six hours a week in each health service area or their local community and they participate in those local accountable communities for health meetings. Um, I'll note too, they're expanding their CPR pilot, that comprehensive payment reform pilot program. Um, they're adding at least two more practices from 2018 to 2019, and this expansion is for qualified independent primary care practices that participate in all three payer programs, so Medicare, Medicaid, and a commercial program. Uh, the program uh, provides additional investments and resources to support the transition to a value-based payment model. <laughs> the specialist program that Melissa mentioned earlier, uh, OneCare intends to design and implement one or more specialty pilot programs that will focus on populations of rising and high risk, where timelier access to care and a connection between primary and specialty care would better support the patient's needs. On this slide, in terms of indirect investments, OneCare has been focused on providing tangible data on cost, utilization, and quality on a quarterly basis in each HSA, with monthly reporting on its six clinical priority areas. Um, these reports are provided to those regional clinical representatives who then um, kind of disseminate the information in their communities 
and are able to use that information for quality improvement. There's also been a continued effort to reduce administrative and provider burden through the Medicaid contract, which allows for removal of prior authorizations. Additionally, as Pat and I described earlier, and as Mike has mentioned, there has been extensive work with HCA and OneCare to develop and implement a modified next generation Medicare program for 2019. The reduction in measures from the Medicare Shared Savings Program is substantial, and it allows for much closer alignment between all of the care programs. <coughs> provider investments. Mike also mentioned this, but you'll notice quite a bit of overlap here from the previous slide in terms of those direct investments. But it's important to note that they're not just to primary care providers. There are several initiatives that provide payments to both primary care and other community-based providers. For example, as part of the Complex Care Coordination Program, the Community Support Care Coordination Payment can be distributed to home health designated agencies or area agencies on aging if the attributed life has designated them as their lead care coordinator. In addition, there's a one-time patient activation payment available to community providers supporting those patients of the highest risk. And that is a one-time annual payment and then there's an additional PM PM that gets added on for those patients. New this year, OneCare has proposed including innovation funds that would support innovative evidence-based <coughs> programs that align with the clinical priorities of the ACO. The goal is to uh, identify programs that can be easily replicated and sustained across other communities. For indirect investments to community providers, there's been movement towards implementation of the next generation Medicare waivers. For example, the SNF, SNF, three-day rule waiver is currently um, in action in Middlebury and is proposed to be started in the Burlington area. There's been work done between care coordination programs <coughs> and designated agencies, as noted here, to develop and implement the 42 CFR Part 2 consent form process for Care Navigator. And this will allow um, access to pertinent medical information for those attributed lives with mental health or substance use diagnoses. Also in Care Navigator, Expanded patient educational resources are available, and those topics include <coughs> things like chronic disease, nutrition, and other available support services within the community. So, for the last portion of statutory criteria that we examined, it's regarding one care in Vermont social determinants of health and adverse childhood experience investments. So I wanted to level set uh, what social determinants of health is defined by the Healthy People 2020 framework. Um, it, social determinants of health include education, health and health care, their social and community context, economic stability, neighborhood, and built environment. And this is a very broad framework, but examples of those include stable housing, access to health care, access to healthy foods, exposure to violence, and so forth. So. Um, as you'll see, the PMPM -PM payments that Michelle discussed are mentioned here, and they're providing extra support to primary care and care continuum to allow room for those <laughs> providers to begin to identify social determinants of health. Um, OneCare is adopting a food insecurity statewide tool for the network to use. Uh, food insecurity is one of their key uh, six key clinical priority areas, and so this network tool could be used to identify whether there is food security within a community and then that community could work to um, identify how to improve it. One of her has also adopted RISE Vermont as a primary prevention program um, to address the health of the entire population. Um, they adopted the pilot from Northwestern Medical Center and they've expanded from eight to 20 communities in the state over the past two years. Uh, we noted actually in the hospital budget process that one pair was matching um, the if a hospital put forth 35,000, one care would also match that to support their hiring of a coordinator for that community. And one care is offering small Amplify grants to support <coughs> communities to tailor that Rise Vermont program to their own community. So there are 10 common measures that Rise Vermont focuses on. So um, a number of these measures look at increased access to healthy foods, and then they're also looking at the downstream effects of chronic disease. So um, finally, in regards to the younger cohort of OneCare, they're developing a pediatric risk tool for practices to use, which would be, uh, enable that practice to identify their rising risk families. 
Um, they're also de designing a shared care plan for the pediatric population that they could use in concert with that. Um, and then finally, they mentioned that they're working in collaboration with EDH on a new program called Dulce, and it is um, where primary care clinical sites can proactively address social determinants of health and promote healthy development of infants from birth to six, uh, while also providing education and legal support for those families. And there's a pilot in Lamoille County currently that they're examining the potential of to scale up to other, other communities. <laughs> so thus far, um, what kind of recommendations will you as, uh, you know, can you expect us to provide regarding the ACO's investments in population health? Um, first, like last year, we plan to recommend that One Care's population health management programs be funded at a certain percentage of their overall budget. We would also recommend a certain funding requirement for SASH and Blueprint payments so that they don't get lost in the overall ratio of the um, payments out to communities. We'd also like to uh, um, recommend a final full year quality and financial report on the capitation pilot for independent primary care practices. The report that we received midway was preliminary and will re be received in a preliminary quality report. And so we'd like to look at those in concert with each other. Um, with the new specialist payment program, we were considering recommending an implementation and evaluation plan to examine um, the goals that one here has stated that they'd like to increase access to specialists, improve quality and facilitate person-centered care. And so we'd like to know how they're structuring the pilot to achieve those goals and um, work with them to monitor it. We also mentioned earlier that One Care is considering testing out how to implement a variable way to distribute their value-based incentive fund policy um, to primary care. And so they have stated in their budget guidance that some portion of the distribution would be more closely tied to practice level quality performance. And we would possibly recommend that you require one pair to update us on the progress of that. And then finally, uh, another recommendation would be to uh, have one pair tell us what their 2019 clinical priority areas are. <coughs> we have requested those and they explained in their budget submission that they'd be engaging their network in the final quarter of 2018 to review and discuss data in their clinical committees in the first quarter of 2019 which is due to what, that's when the data comes in on due to data lag. So we would very much like to receive those by the end of March in 2019. So this was Kelly's slide, but I'll do my best here. Um, you know, just showing um, the admin expense ratio uh, for One Care, uh, 2018 approved budget, 2018 projected, and then 2019 budget as submitted. Um, uh, the um, kind of highlight that Kelly had here was that the uh, expense ratio um, projected and budgeted for 2019 at below the approved 2018 level. Um, and then uh, population health management and payment reform spending um, as a percentage of revenues ratio um, <clears throat> there for the 2018 budget, uh, 2018 projected and 2019 budget. Um, uh, the, you know, as you can see there, the, the ratio fell below uh, the required level for um, 2018 projection. Uh, one care has um, come in and ex explained that uh, why that is um, due to uh, initial high initial attribution and ramp up of some of the um, population health management spending. Uh, I do think we should um, we can um, kind of work this out, but have one care come back um, uh, next year. Um, do a full recap of their uh, 18 actuals for us. Um, and then the last kind of bullet here that Kelly had was that the salaries and benefits expense line in the budget uh, 
increased 34.7% uh, from the 2018 budget to the 2019 budget, and a large part of that is one care bringing um, rise from on staff in-house, as well as additions, uh, staff additions to reflect their growing network. What was the justification for bringing it in-house? Um, it was a, from what I would understand, it was a pilot in one community that over time had shown success, and the board of managers or whom must have, you know, decided that they wanted to adopt it as a statewide program. We could have one here provide a written justification if you would like, but that would be the only way for them to scale it statewide. Curious because other communities have had programs similar to the Rise of Vermont. So, for example, Rutland has the Health Trust. Does that mean that if Rutland takes on a bigger uh, role in attributed lives, that some money could be transferred through One Care to Bows, um, similar to what's happening with Rise of Vermont in other areas, or, or what? Good question. I don't want to. Um, we can we can look at okay. it, ask them, but I, I, I would see why not. Okay. Thank you. Um, we can move to next steps, or we can take questions on this section of the presentation. Whatever you prefer. Well, let's take questions. Any questions from the board? Tom. So I'm just trying to uh, tie a couple of things out here. On the table that you have up, uh, on, on the screen now, it's, it says that the population health and payment reform spending uh, is 3.1%. And so I'm, I'm going backwards to the chart to, and I don't know what page it on, but it was 2018 and 2019, uh, <coughs> one came from population health investments at $27.29 million. So um, under 2018 approved. Um, so now you're looking at 2018 budget projected uh, and those items are down to 2.3%. And so um, there is a variance between budgeted amounts and um, projected amounts. Apparently, I, I, and I'm just wondering how those two tables relate to each other. Yeah, we didn't include the, um, the 2018 budget on this table. We could easily do that for you. That'd be helpful to see that too. Um, yeah, because that, it looks like it would be a sizable amount that's not being spent in 2018 if we're dropping from. 3.1% unless, to 2.3%. Unless the, the revenue base denominator has changed a lot, which I don't think it has. I think the revenue base did change. It did change? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that percent change might be attributable to the revenue percent change as opposed to a change in actual spending. Uh, yep. I think uh, <coughs> it's probably a combination of both that we can. And one more. Um, you know, when I, uh, as you know, we had a discussion when I first kind of saw the uh, per member per month growth rate of Medicaid uh, for 2019 projected over 2018 actual, I think it was like one half of 1%. And that seemed low to me, but uh, you folks uh, appropriately made the point that here is also additional spending that is uh, driven by Medicaid. And so you really have to kind of include that in the mix. And I think that's a, a, a fair uh, response. But is it possible to get down through um, uh, these two columns and attribute where the funding source is for each? Um, so that as we're kind of looking through the overall budget of one care, um, we know that, that these funds also must be included in terms of trying to come up with a, an overall per member per month uh, investment. Is that, is that a reasonable question? Uh, I, I think I understand. I mean, I understand what you're getting at, and we can try to put something together that 
DSM, uh, Medicaid, kind of non-target funding of admin and programs to help you understand kind of the additional money they're putting in above and beyond rate. Are, are, the, are, are they the only one, is Medicaid the only one that's putting in additional money? So what is most of this Medicaid funding? I would not, I would not say most of this is Medicaid funding. Okay. I think that's the question. Well, if you Some of it's funded under the withholds from hospitals, and some of it's funded by the seven and a half million from Medicare uh, for the blueprint and stash payments yep. trended forward. So it's kind of a mix. Right. So, I mean, my question is, as best as you can, is just to tie this total amount out to the various sources of funding, not just Medicaid, but, you know, uh, Robin, <coughs> a couple of other examples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. Any other questions? I have a couple of comments. Um, on um, the social determinants of health and adverse childhood experiences slide, uh, this is really just more of a comment. I thought uh, not all of you were able to come with us to Mount Muscatney for uh, our visit down there, but I, I thought it was interesting to really see how some of these investments were playing out in a community. And I, for me, at least, it gave more of a qualitative feel to some of, to some of these activities. Um, we had one of the participants at our meeting was talking about the Amplify grants and how they were looking at, at using those within the community to re-engage youth activities and uh, promote uh, more exercise locally and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to connect uh, those two dots uh, out loud because I thought that was an interesting way to see how some of this is catalyzing a different kind of relationship in at least one community that we visited uh, in the industry. Thank you. Uh, um, financial observation on 44, and I can follow up with Kelly if we need to, but I wonder whether the change in the admin expense ratio has anything to do with the way they're now handling the risk reserve, which they're not including in the budget, originally they had it as an expense for 2018, and then now in 19 they have it as net income. They, they have it as you know, what's left over. So I, I, that might be what's driving the change from 18 budget down to projected, and then you know. So, so we really should look at that because if we're including that in the numbers, it should be in the admin expense ratio. That's not the way they're categorizing it. Uh, but I think it's a difference because if you remember in their budget of 18, they had a million five in there, and they didn't spend it, they only spent about 700,000, so that's in their 18. And then they're putting 2.2 million in a reserve in 18, that probably needs to be added back, and 2.8 in 19. So I can check with Kelly on that, but. Okay, any other questions or comments from the board? Questions or comments from the public? Susan? Um, the slide um, with indirect investments, uh, indir that one, um, I noticed that you have implementation of the next gen Medicare waivers. Can you explain um, how implementing a three day stay waiver is an indirect investment in the community provider? Several of these Medicare waivers were of interest with the community providers because it provided an innovative way for them to care for their patients if the patient so elected to waive their three-day stay and go directly to the home. So My understanding of the three-day waiver, for the record, I was part of a three-day stay um, committee that met with One Care when I worked for the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. And all that the three-day stay waiver does is it skips the part of requiring someone to be in a hospital for three days before a nursing home would cover them um, for care in a nursing, before Medicare would cover them for care in a nursing home. Um, they don't get any other enhanced benefits. They get the same home health that they would be entitled to 
um, otherwise. So I'm just not understanding where an investment is being made well, in a community we, provider. So as we mentioned, the investments are not always financial. They're, they could be value-based. And so we see potentially the next generation program as offering value-based alternatives to the traditional Medicare program. Yeah. I would love a concrete example of how any community provider is benefiting from the implementation of the next year later. It's something that they receiving something of value that they wouldn't otherwise be receiving from their Medicare patients. I think that we could follow up with one car on that. Any other public comment or questions? Yes. Um, so, Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. So, we did provide a uh, written comment to the board, uh, I think, late last week, and I'm not going to review that now. But I did want to just speak on a high level that I know over the last couple of years, um, many, whether it be from the payer perspective or from the other policy perspectives, have uh, approached One Care with a great deal of um, giving them the benefit of the doubt, because after all, they are building something that um, hasn't been done here before, and there's a, a lot of details that that we really do need to figure out how to do. I appreciate that and understand that dynamic. Um, I, I also believe that um, that we have now stood. Up one care. One care is functioning, and uh, that. Um, and I guess my my general comment to the board is that I think it's time to ramp up our level of scrutiny and uh, our level of accountability. Um, so that's my general comment. As as you go forward and as we go forward, um, we will continue to uh, attempt to ramp up our our level of scrutiny. Thank you, Mike. Susan? Yeah, just another question about some of these investments. I know that some of these investments are directly covered by DIVA's investments, contracts with OneCare, uh, with delivery system reform investments, and I'm just wondering if Green Mountain Care Board had asked OneCare in its budget documents uh, to indicate, like, what percent of dollars are just is one care just passing through as with the stash and community health payments and the stuff from diva and what what monies are you know coming from one cares income separate from public dollars just to know what the public i mean these we're calling them one care investments but they're really public investments they're investments of medicaid delivery system reform dollars directly from medicaid to one care via contract but they then become one care investments, and I'm just wondering if there's any way that we can trace what the public investment is um, for these community provider investments. Uh, the, I mean, so one care's income statement has the Medicaid. Um, Kind of program revenue that it's expecting or budgeting broken out um, in a pretty detailed fashion. That's in Appendix 4 of the submission online. If you want to look at it and see if that is sufficient for you or if there's additional kind of detail that, that you're needing, that'd be helpful. I, I see the money coming in. It's just the question of the money going out. You know, so. It would be nice to know if all of that, the money from Medicaid is both making its way into these community providers. I just don't know if there's any way to track that. Okay. Um, we can try to work on something. Okay, other questions or comments from the public? Closing uh, words of wisdom, Mike. Uh, just Um, we are doing our level best to get the data we need from 
Medicare, we're still waiting on data from Medicaid for the Medicaid rate case. Uh, we're trying to, you know, make sure that Jackie Lee is talking with, with Wakely to get all set up so that that goes as expeditiously as possible. Um, and we are targeting November 28th as when we will come back to you with recommendations on rates and risk and all the stuff that I know folks are probably antsy to talk about. Um, it may be the 12th, though, to be honest. Um, it, it may have to be the 12th. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep you informed about how that's looking. Um, and, and, it's, and like I said earlier, December 17th, that Monday is kind of the, the day things need to happen in terms of votes on the Medicare rate and the ACL budget. Um, we have extended the public comment period given our timeline extensions to December 10th uh, with the um, expectation that December 12th would be the earliest day would be voted. So you don't believe that November 28th is possible? I, well, we're supposed to hear back on a timeline for getting some data from Medicare today, so I'll know better whether that's realistic or not later when I get back to my computer. I'm just concerned that if you extend the public comment to December 10th, that's pretty much saying it's going to be December 12th, period. Well, December 12th would be the soonest I would assume you would vote. Okay. Anyway, it became due on November 28th. Okay. And can I just add to um, that Jackie